All those time, all those times we were in that bathroom, she was just three toilets away. All those times we were in that bathroom, she was just three toilets away, said Ron bitterly at breakfast next day. And we could have asked her, and now it had been hard enough trying to look for spiders, escaping their teachers long enough to sneak into a girl's bathroom. The girl's bathroom, moreover, right next to the scene of the first attack, was going to be almost impossible. But something happened in their first lesson, transfiguration which drove the Chamber of Secrets out of their minds for the first time in weeks. Ten minutes into the class, Professor McGonagall told them that their exams would start on the 1st of June. One week from today. Exams? Oh, Seamus Finnegan. We're still getting exams? There was a loud bang behind Harry as Neville Longbottom's wand slipped, vanishing one of the legs on his desk. Professor McGonagall restored it with a wave of her own wand and turned frowning to Seamus. The whole point of keeping the school open at this time is for you to receive your education, she said sternly. The exams will therefore take place as you will therefore take place as usual, and I trust you are all revising hard. Revising hard. It had never occurred to Harry that there would be exams with the castle in this state. There was a great deal of mutinous muttering around the room, which made Professor McGonagall scowl even more darkly. Professor Dumbledore's instructions were to keep the school running as normally as possible, she said. And that, I need hardly point out, means finding out how much you have learnt this year. Harry looked down at the pair of white rabbits. He was supposed to be turning into slippers. What had he learned so far this year? He couldn't seem to think of anything that would be useful in an exam. Ron looked as though he'd just been told he had to go and live in the Forbidden Forest. Can you imagine me taking exams with this? he asked Harry holding up his wand, which had just started whistling loudly. Three days before their first exam, Professor McGonagall made another announcement at breakfast. I've got, I have good news, she said, and the Great Hall, instead of falling silent, erupted. Dumbledore's coming back, several people yelled joyfully. You caught the air at Slytherin? No, sorry, Dumbledore's coming back, several people yelled joyfully. You caught the air of Slytherin? Squealed a girl on the Ravenclaw table. Quidditch matches are back on, roared Wood excitedly. When the hubbub had subsided, Professor McGonagall said, Professor Sprout has informed me that the mandrakes are ready for cutting at last. Tonight we will be able to revive those people who have been petrified. I need hardly remind you all that one of them may well be able to tell us who or what attacked them. I am hopeful that this dreadful year will end with our catching the culprit. There was an explosion of cheering. Harry looked over at the Slytherin table and wasn't at all surprised to see that Draco Malfoy hadn't joined in. Ron, however, was looking happier than he'd looked in days. It won't matter that we never asked Myrtle then, he said to Harry. Hermione will probably have all the answers when they wake her up. Mind you, she'll go mad when she finds you. And when she finds out we got exams in three days time, she hasn't revised.
it might be kinder to leave her where she is till they're over. Just then, Ginny Weasley came over and sat down next to Ron. She looked tense and nervous, and Harry noticed her hands were twisting in her lap. What's up? said Ron, helping himself to more porridge. Ginny didn't say anything, but glanced up and down the Gryffindor table with a scared look on her face that reminded Harry of someone, though he couldn't think who. Spit it out! said Ron, watching her. Harry suddenly realised who Ginny looked like. She was making backwards and for she was rocking backwards and forwards slightly in her chair, exactly like Dobby did when he was teetering on the edge of revealing forbidden information. I've got to tell you something, Ginny mumbled carefully, not looking at Harry. What is it? said Harry. She looked as though she couldn't find the right words. What? said Ron. Ginny opened her mouth, but no sound came out. Harry leaned forward and spoke quietly so that only Ginny and Ron could hear him. Is it something about the Chamber of Secrets? Have you seen something? Someone acting oddly? Ginny drew a deep breath, and at that precise moment Percy Weasley appeared, looking tired and wan. If you've finished eating, I'll take that seat, Ginny. I'm starving. I've only just come off patrol duty. Ginny jumped up, as though her chair had just been electrified, gave Percy a fleeting, frightened look, and scarpered away. Percy sat down and grabbed a mug from the centre of the table. Percy, said Ron angrily. She was just about to tell us something important. Halfway through a gulp of tea, Percy choked. What sort of thing? He said, coughing. I just asked her if she'd seen something, if she'd seen anything odd, and she started to say, Oh, that. That's nothing to do with the Chamber of Secrets, said Percy at once. How do you know? said Ron, his eyebrows raised. Well, uh, if you must know, Ginny, uh, walked in, walked in on me the other day when I was, well, never mind. The point is, she spotted me doing something I, um, asked her not to mention it to anybody, I must say. I must say, I did think she'd keep her word. It's nothing really, I'd just rather... Harry had never seen Percy look so uncomfortable. What were you doing, Percy? asked Ron, grinning. Go on, tell us, we won't laugh. Percy didn't smile back. Pass me those rolls, Harry, I'm starving. Harry knew the whole mystery might be solved tomorrow without their help, but he wasn't about to pass up a chance to speak to Myrtle if it turned up. And to his delight it did. Mid-morning when they were being led to History of Magic by Gildroy Lockhart, Lockhart, who had so often assured them that all danger had passed, only to be proved wrong straight away, was now wholeheartedly convinced that it was hardly worth the trouble to see them safely down the corridors. His hair wasn't as sleek as usual. It seemed to have been up most. He seemed it seemed to have been up most of the night, patrolling the fourth floor. Mark my words, he said, ushering them around a corner. The first words out about those poor petrified people's mouths will be It was Hagrid. Frankly, I'm astounded Professor McGonagall thinks all these security measures are necessary. I agree, sir, said Harry, making Ron drop his books in surprise. 
Thank you, Harry, said Lockhart graciously, while they waited for a long line of Hufflepuffs to pass. I mean, we teachers have quite enough to be getting on with without walking students to classes and standing guard all night. That's right, said Ron, catching on. Why don't you leave us? You know, Weasley, I think I will, said Lockhart. I really should go and prepare my next class. And he hurried off. Prepare his class? Ron sneered after him. Gone to curl his hair more like. They let the rest of the Gryffindors draw ahead of them, then darted down a side passage and hurried towards, hurried off towards Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. But just as they were congratulating each other on their brilliant scheme. Potter, Weasley, what are you doing? It was Professor McGonagall. Her mouth was the thinnest of thin lines. We were, we were, Ron stammered. We were going to, to go and see Hermione, said Harry. Ron and Professor McGonagall both looked at him. We haven't seen her for ages, Professor, Harry went on hurriedly, treading on Ron's foot, and we thought we'd sneak into the... Hospital wing, you know, and tell her the mandrakes are nearly ready and, uh, not to worry, Professor McGonagall was still staring at him, and for a moment, Harry thought she was going to explode, but when she spoke, it was in a strangely croaky voice, of course, she said to him. and Harry, amazed, saw her glistening. Uh, saw a tear glistening in her beady eye. Of course, I realise this has all been the hardest on the fr on the friends of those who have been. I quite understand. Yes, Potter. Of course, you may visit Miss Granger. I will inform Professor Binns well where you're gone. Tell Madame Pomfrey I've given my permission. Harry and Ron walked away, hardly daring to believe that they had avoided detention. As they turned the corner, they distinctly heard Professor McGonagall blow her nose. That, said Ron, fervently, was the best story you've ever come up with. They had no choice now but to go to the hospital wing and tell Madame Pomfrey that they had Professor McGonagall's permission to visit Hermione. Madame Pomfrey let them in, but reluctantly. There's just no point talking to a petrified person, she said. And they had to admit she was right, and they'd taken their seats next to Hermione, and when they'd taken their seats next to Hermione, it was plain that Hermione didn't have the faintest inkling that she had visitors, and they might, and that they might just as well tell her a bedside her bedside cabinet not to worry, for all the good it would do. Wonder if she did see the attacker though, said Ron looking sadly at Hermione's rigid face. Because if he sneaked up on them, on them all, no one will ever know. But Harry wasn't looking at Hermione's face. He was more interested in her right hand. It lay clenched on top of a, on top of her blankets, and bending closer, he saw that a piece of paper was scrunched inside her fist. Making sure that Madame Pomfrey was nowhere near, he pointed this out to Ron. Try and get it out, Ron whispered shifting his chair so that he blocked Harry from Madame Pomfrey's view. It was no easy task, Hermione's hand was clamped so tightly around the paper that Harry was sure he was going to tear it. He was going to tear it. While Ron kept watch, he tugged and twisted, and at last, after several tense minutes, the paper came free. 
It was a page from a very old library book. Harry smoothed it out eagerly and Ron leaned close to read it too. Of many fearsome beasts and monsters that roam our land, there is none more curious and more deadly than the basilisk, known also as the king of serpents, this snake which may reach gigantic size and live many hundreds of years is born from a chicken's egg, hatched beneath a toad. Its methods of killing are most wondrous, for, us, for aside from its deadly and venomous fangs, the basilisk is, has a murderous stare, and all who are fixed with the beam of its eye shall suffer instant death. Spiders flee before the basilisk, for it is their mortal enemy, and the basilisk flees only from the crowing of the rooster, which is fatal to it. And beneath this, a single word had been written in a hand Harry, Harry recognised as Hermione's pipes. It was as though somebody had just flicked a light on in his brain. Ron, he breathed, this is it. This is the answer, the monster in the chambers of Basilisk, a giant serpent. That's why I've been hearing that voice all over the place, and nobody else has heard it. It's because I understand parcel tongue. Harry looked up at the beds around him. The Basilisk kills people by looking at them. But no one's died, because no one looked at it straight in the eye. Colin saw it through his camera. The basilisk burned up all the film inside it. But Colin just got petrified. Justin. Justin must have seen the basilisk through nearly headless Nick. Nick got full blast of it, but he couldn't die again. And Hermione and that Ravenclaw prefect we were found with a mirror next to them. Hermione had just realised the monster was a basilisk, I'd bet you anything. She warned the first person she met to look around the corners with a mirror first. And that girl pulled out her mirror and... Ron's jaw dropped. And Mrs Norris? He whispered eagerly. Harry thought hard, picturing the scene of, on the night of Halloween. The water, he said slowly. The flood from Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. I bet you Mrs. Norris only saw the reflection. He scanned the page in his hand eagerly. The more he looked at it, the more it made sense. The crowing of the rooster is fatal to it, he read aloud. Hagrid's roosters were killed. The heir of Slytherin didn't want one anywhere near the castle once the chamber was opened. Spiders flee before it, it all fits. But how's the basilisk been getting around the place? A dirty grey snake, said Ron. A dirty grey snake, someone would have seen. Harry, however, pointed at the word Hermione had scribbled at the foot of the page. Pipes, he said. Pipes. Ron, it's been using the plumbing. I've been hearing that voice inside the walls. Ron suddenly grabbed Harry's arm. The entrance to the Chamber of Secrets. At the entrance of the Chamber of Secrets, he said hoarsely. What if it's, what if it's a bathroom? What if it's in... Moaning Myrtle's bathroom, said Harry. They sat there, excitement coursing through them. Hardly able to believe it. This means, said Harry, I can't be the only parcel mouth in the school. The heir of Slytherin's one too. That's how they've been controlling the basilisk. What are we going to do, said Ron, whose eyes were flashing. Shall we go straight to McGonagall? Let's go to the staff room, said Harry, jumping up. 
She'll be in ten. She'll be there in ten minutes. It's nearly break. They ran downstairs, not wanting to be discovered hanging around. In another corridor, they went straight into the deserted staff room. It was a large panelled room, full of dark wooden chairs. Harry and Ron paced around it, too excited to sit down. But the bell to signal break never came. Instead, echoing through the corridors came Professor McGonagall's voice, magically magnified. All students to return to their house dormitories at once. All teachers return to the staff room immediately, please. Harry wheeled around to stare at Ron. Not another attack. Not now. <laughs> Not another attack. Not now. What do we do? said Ron aghast. Go back to the dormitory. No, said Harry, glancing around. There was an ugly sort of wardrobe to his left, full of the teacher's cloaks. In there. Let's hear what it's all about. Then we can tell them what we found out. They hid themselves inside it, listening to the rumbling of hundreds of people moving overhead and the staff room door hanging open from between the musty folds of the cloaks. They watched the teachers filtering into the room. Some of them were looking puzzled, others downright scared. Then Professor McGonagall arrived. It has happened, she told the silent staff room. A student has been taken by the monster right into the chamber itself. Professor Flitwick let out a squeal. Professor Sprout clapped her hands to her mouth. Snape gripped the back of a chair very hard and said, How can you be sure? The air is slithering, said Professor McGonagall, who was very white. Left another message. Right underneath the first one, a skeleton will lie in the chamber forever. Professor Flitwick burst into tears. Who is it? said Madam Hooch, who had sunk weak kneed into a chair. Which student? Ginny Weasley, said Professor McGonagall. Harry felt Ron slide silently down in onto the wardrobe floor beside him. We shall have to we shall have to send all the students home tomorrow, said Professor McGonagall. This is the end of Hogwarts. Dumbledore always said the staff room door banged open again. For one wild moment, Harry was sure it would be Dumbledore, but it was Lockhart, and he was beaming. So sorry, doze off. What have I missed? He didn't seem to notice that the other teachers were looking at him with something remarkably like hatred. Snape stepped forward. Just the man, he said. The very man. A girl has been snatched by the monster Lockhart, taken into the chamber of secrets itself. Your moment has come at last. Lockhart blanched. That's right, Gilderoy, chipped in Professor Sprout. Weren't you saying just last night that you've known all along where the chamber, where the entrance to the chamber of secrets is? I, well, I, spluttered Lockhart. Yes. Didn't you tell me you were sure you knew what was inside it? No. Yes, didn't you tell me you were sure you knew what was inside it? Piped up Professor Flitwick. D did I? I don't recall. I certainly remember you saying you were sorry you hadn't had a crack at the monster before Hagrid was arrested. No, sorry. I certainly remember you saying you were sorry you hadn't had a crack at the monster before Hagrid was, Hagrid was arrested, said Snape. Didn't you say that the whole affair had been bungled? And that <clears throat> you should have been given a, a free reign over the, uh, from the first? 
didn't you say that the whole affair had been bungled and that you should have been given a free re a free rein from the first? Lockhart stared around at his stony faced colleagues. I I really never You may have misunderstood. We'll leave it to you then, Gilderoy, said Professor McGonagall. Tonight will be an excellent time to do it. We'll make sure everyone's out of our out of your way. You'll be able to tackle the monster all by yourself, a free reign at last. Lockhart gazed desperately around him. But nobody came to the rescue. He didn't look remotely handsome any more. His lip was trembling, and in the absence of his usually toothy grin, he looked weak-chinned and weedy. But very well, he said. I'll... I'll be in my office getting... getting ready. And he left the room. Right, said Professor McGonagall, whose nostrils were flared. That's got him out from under our feet. The heads of houses should go and inform their students what has happened. Tell them the Hogwarts Express will take them home first thing tomorrow. Will the rest, if you please, make sure, will the rest, if you please, make sure no students have been left outside their dormitories? The teachers rose and left one by one. It was probably the worst day of Harry's entire life. He, Ron, Fred and George, sat together in a corner of the Gryffindor common room, unable to say anything to each other. Percy wasn't there. He had gone to send an owl to Mr and Mrs Weasley, and then shut himself up in his dormitory. No afternoon ever lasted as long as that one, nor had Gryffindor Tower ever been so crowded, yet so quiet. Near sunset, Fred and George went up to bed, unable to sit there any longer. She knew something, Harry, said Ron, speaking for the first time since they'd entered the wardrobe in the staff room. That's why she was taken. It wasn't some stupid thing about Percy at all. She found out something about the Chamber of Secrets. That must be why she was... Ron rubbed his eyes frantically. I mean, she was a pure blood. That can't be. There can't be any other reason. Harry could see the sun sinking blood red below the skyline. This was the worst he'd ever felt. If only there was something they could do, anything. Harry, said Ron. Do you think there's any chance at all she's not, you know? Harry didn't know what to say. He couldn't see how Ginny could still be alive. Do you know what? said Ron. I think we should go and see Lockhart. Tell him what we know. He's going to try and get into the chamber. We can tell him where we think it is and tell him it's a basilisk in there. Because Harry couldn't think of anything else to do, and because he wanted to be doing something, he agreed. The Gryffindors around them were so miserable and felt so sorry for the Weasleys that nobody tried to stop them as they got up, crossed the room and left through the portrait hole. Darkness was falling as they walked down to Lockhart's office. They seemed to be, there seemed to be a lot of activity going on inside it. They could hear scraping, thumbs and hurried footsteps. Harry knocked and there was a sudden silence from the inside. Then the door opened, the tiniest crack, and they saw one of Lockhart's eyes peering through it. Oh, Mr Potter, Mr Weasley, he said, opening the door. A mite wider. I'm rather busy at the moment. If you would be quick. Professor, we got some informa we got some information for you, said Harry. We think it'll help you. Uh well, 
it's not terribly the inside of Lockhart's face at the side of Lockhart's face that they could see looked very uncomfortable. I mean, well, all right. He opened the door and they entered. His office had been almost completely stripped. Two large trunks stood open on the floor. Robes jade and green, lilac, midnight blue, have been hastily folded into one of them. Books were jumbled untidily into the other. The photographs he had covered the walls, uh, that had covered the walls, now crammed into boxes on the desk. Are you going somewhere? said Harry. Uh, well, yes, said Lockhart, ripping like a half-sized poster of himself. Not ripping, yeah, ripping a half life ripping a life-size poster of himself from the back of the door as he spoke, starting to roll it up. Urgent call, unavoidable, got to go. What about my sister? said Ron jerkily. Well, as to that, most unfortunate, said Lockhart, avoiding their eyes as he wrenched open a drawer and started emptying the contents into a bag. No one regrets more than I. You're the defence against the dark ass teacher, said Harry. You can't go now. Not with all the dark stuff going on here. Well, I must say, when I took the job, Lockhart muttered, now pulling socks on top of his robes, nothing in the job description didn't expect... You mean you're running away, said Harry, disbelievingly, after all that stuff you did in your books? Books can be misleading, said Lockhart delicately. You wrote them, Harry shouted. My dear boy, said Lockhart, straightening up and frowning at Harry. Do use your common sense. My books wouldn't have sold half as well if people didn't think I'd done all those things. No one wants to read about some ugly old Arnhemian. Armenian warlock. Even if he did save a village from werewolves, he'd look dreadful on the front cover. No dress sense at all, and the witch who banished the abandoned banshee had a hair lip. I mean, come on. You've just been taking credit for, for, for what a load of other people have done said Harry incredulously. Harry, Harry, said Lockhart, shaking his head impatiently. It's not nearly as simple as that. There was work involved. I had to track those people down, ask them exactly how they have managed to do what they did. Then I put a memory charm on them so they wouldn't remember doing it. If there's one thing I pride myself on, it's my memory charms. Now, it's been a lot of work, Harry. It's not all book signings and publicity photos, you know. I want fame. You have to be prepared. You want fame. You have to be prepared for a long, hard slog. He banged the lids of his trunk shut and locked them. Let's see, he said. I think that's everything. Yes, only one thing left. He pulled out his wand and turned to them. Awfully sorry, boys. But I'll have to put a memory charm on you, on you now. Can't have you blabbing my secrets all over the place. I'd never sell another book. Harry reached his wand just in time. Lockhart had barely raised his when Harry bellowed, Expelliarmus! Lockhart was blasted backwards, falling over his trunk. His wand flew high into the air. Ron caught it and flung it out of the open window. Shouldn't have let Professor Snape teach. Yeah, shouldn't have let Professor Snape teach us that one. Said said Harry furiously, kicking Lockhart's trunk aside. Lockhart was looking up at them. Look at, look at, looking up at him. Weedy once more. Harry was still pointing his wand at him. 
What do you want me to do? said Lockhart weakly. I don't know quite where the Chamber of Secrets is. There's nothing I can do. You're in luck, said Harry, forcing Lockhart to his feet. At one point. We think we know where it is. And what's inside it? Let's go. They marched Lockhart out of his office and down the nearest stairs, along the dark corridor where the messages shone on the wall, to the door of Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. They sent Lockhart in first. Harry was pleased to see that he was shaking. Moaning Myrtle was sitting in the cistern of the toilet of the end toilet. Oh, it's you, she said, when she saw Harry. What do you want this time? To ask you how you died, said Harry. Myrtle's whole aspect changed at once. She looked as though she'd never been asked such a flattering question. Oh, it was dreadful, she said with relish. It happened right here. I died in this very cubicle. I remember it so well. I'd hidden because Oliver Hornby was teasing me about my glasses. The door was locked and I was crying and then I heard somebody come in. They said something funny, a different language. I think it must have been... Anyway, what really got to me was that it was a boy speaking, so I unlocked the door to tell him to go and use his own toilet and then... Myrtle swelled importantly, her face shining. I died. How? Asked Harry. No idea, said Myrtle in hushed tones. I just remember seeing a pair of great big yellow eyes. My whole body sort of seized up, and then I was floating away. She looked dreamily at Harry, and then I came back again. I was determined to haunt Olive Hornby. Sorry, Olive, not Oliver. Olive Hornby. You see? Oh, she was sorry. She never, she never laughed at my glasses. No, she. Oh, she was sorry. She never laughed at my glasses. Where exactly did you see the eyes? Said Harry. Somewhere there, said Myrtle, pointing vaguely towards the sink in front of the, in front of her toilet. Harry and Ron hurried over to it. Lockhart was standing well back. A look of utter terror on his face. It looked like an ordinary sink. They examined every inch of it. I mean, inside and out, including the pipes below. And then Harry saw it. Scratched on the side of one of the copper taps was a tiny snake. That tap's never worked said Myrtle. Now that tap's never worked, said Myrtle brightly. As he tried to turn it, Harry, said Ron, say something. Something in parcel tongue. But Harry thought hard. The only times he'd ever managed to speak parcel tongue were when he'd been faced with a real snake. He stared hard at the tiny engraving trying to imagine it was real. Open up, he said. He looked at Ron, who shook his head. English, he said. Harry looked back at the snake, willing himself to believe it was alive. If he moved his head, the candlelight made it look as though it was moving. Open up, he said. Except the words weren't what they heard. A strange hissing had escaped him.
and at once the tap glowed with a brilliant white light and began to spin. Next second, the sink began to move. The sink, in fact, sank right out of sight, leaving a large pipe exposed, a pipe wide enough for a man to slide into. Harry heard Ron gasp and looked up again. He had made up his mind he was what he was going to do. I'm going down there, he said. He couldn't not go, not now, that they had found the entrance to the chamber. Not if there was even the faintest, slimmest, wildest chance of, uh, that Ginny might be alive. Me too, said Ron. There was a pause. Well, you hardly seem to need me, said Lockhart, with a shadow of his old smile. I'll just... He put his hand on the doorknob, but Ron and Harry both pointed their wands at him. You can go first, Ron snarled. White-faced and wandless, Lockhart approached the opening. Boys, he said, his voice feeble. Boys, what good will that do? Harry jabbed him in the back with his wand. Lockhart slid his legs into the pipe. I really don't think... He started to say, but Ron gave him a push, and he slid right out of sight. Harry followed quickly. He lowered himself slowly into the pipe, then let go. It was like rushing down an endless slimy dark slide. He could see more pipes branching off in all directions, but none as large as theirs, which twisted and turned, sloping deeply downwards. And he knew that he was falling deeper below the school than even the dangerous, than even the dungeons. Behind him, he could hear Ron thudding slightly at the curves. And then, just as he'd begun to worry about what would happen if he hit the ground, the pipe levelled out, and he shot out of the end with a wet thud landing on the damp floor of a dark stone tunnel. Large enough to stand in, Lockhart was getting to his feet a little way away, covered in slime and white as a ghost. Harry stood aside as Ron came whizzing out of the pipe too. We must be miles under the school, said Harry his voice echoing in the black tunnel. Under the lake, probably, said Ron, squinting around at the dark, slimy walls. All three of them turned to stare into the darkness ahead. Lumos, Harry muttered to his wand, and it lit again. Come on, he said to Ron and Lockhart, and off they went, their footsteps slapping loudly on the wet floor. The tunnel was so dark that they could only see a little distance ahead. Their shadows on the wet walls looked monstrous in the wand light. Remember, Harry said quietly, as they walked cautiously forward, any sign of movement, close your eyes straight away. But the tunnel was quite was quiet as a grave. And he first it, and he first unexpected and the first unexpected sound they heard was a loud crunch as Ron stepped on what turned out to be a rat's skull. Harry lowered his wand to look at the floor, and now that it was littered with small and saw that it was littered with small animal bones, trying very hard not to imagine Ginny and what Ginny might look like if they found her. Harry led the way forward, round a dark bend in the tunnel. Harry, there's something up there, said Ron hoarsely. Grabbing Harry's shoulder, they froze, watching. Yeah, they froze, watching. Harry could just see the outline of something huge and curved 
lying right across the tunnel. It wasn't moving. Maybe it's asleep, he breathed, glancing back at the other two. Lockhart's hands were pressed over his eyes. Harry turned back to look at the thing, his heart beating so fast it hurt. Very slowly, his eyes as narrow as he could make them and still see. Harry edged forward, his wand held high. The light slid over a gigantic snake skin of a vivid, poisonous green, lying curled up and empty across the tunnel floor. The creature had shed that, that has shed it must have been twenty feet long at least. Blimey, said Ron weakly. There was a sudden movement behind them. Gilderoy Lockhart's knees had given way. Get up, said Ron sharply, pointing his wand at Lockhart. Lockhart got to his feet. Then he dived at Ron, knocking him to the ground. Harry jumped forward, but too late. Lockhart was straightening up, panting, Ron's wand in his hand, and a gleaming smile back on his face. The adventure ends here, boys, he said. I shall take a bit of the skin back up to the school, tell them it was too late to save the girl, and that you two tragically lost your minds at the sight of her mangled body. Say goodbye to your memories. He raised one spellotate wand high over his head and yelled, Obliviate! The wand exploded with the force of a small bomb. Harry flung his arms over his head and ran, slipping over, over the coils of snakeskin, out of the way of great chunks of tunnel ceiling, which were thundering to the floor. Next moment he was standing alone, gazing at a solid wall of broken rock. Ron, he shouted, are you okay, Ron? I'm here, came Ron's muffled voice from behind the rock fall. I'm okay, this gets not though. He got blasted by the wand. There was a dull thud and a loud ow. It sounded as though Ron had just kicked Lockhart in the shins. What now? Ron's voice said, sounding desperate. We can't get through, it'll take ages. Harry looked up at the tunnel ceiling. Huge cracks had appeared in it. He had never tried to break apart anything as large as these rocks by magic, and now didn't seem a good moment to try. What if the whole tunnel caved in? There was another thud and another OW! From behind the rocks, they were wasting time. Ginny had already been in the Chamber of Secrets for hours. She knew, no, Harry knew there was only one thing to do. Wait there, he called to Ron. Wait with Lockhart. I'll go on. If I'm not back in an hour, there was a very pregnant pause. I'll try and shift some of the ro some of this rock, said Ron. He seemed to be trying to keep his voice steady. So you can, can get back through. And Harry? See you in a bit, said Harry, trying to inject some confidence into his shaking voice. And he set off alone past the giant snakeskin. Soon the distant noise of Ron straining to shift the rocks was gone. The tunnel turned and turned again. Every nerve in Harry's body was tingling unpleasantly. He wanted the turn. He wanted the tunnel to end, yet dreaded what he'd find when it did. And then at last, as he crept around yet another bend, he saw a solid wall ahead on which two entwined serpents were carved. 
their eyes set with great glinting emeralds. Harry approached, his throat very dry. There was no need to pretend these stone snakes were real. Their eyes looked strangely alive. He could guess what he had to do. He cleared his throat and the emerald eyes seemed to flicker. Open, said Harry in a low, faint hiss. The serpents parted as the wall cracked open. The half slid smoothly out of sight, and Harry, shaking from head to foot, walked inside. And that, my friends, was chapter 16 of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Join me next time as I read the penultimate chapter, that's number 17. Until then, bye.